So Ezekiel 25 through 32 is Ezekiel's long section on judgment, and we're going to be marching through all of it this morning. Uh, this is specifically judgment on the nations who are surrounding Judah. So these chapters are judgment upon the nations of Ammon, Moab, Edom, Philistia, Tyre, and Sidon, which is one nation, and Egypt. And the purpose of these chapters is to prevent the nations who are surrounding Jerusalem from boasting over Jerusalem's fall. So it would be really easy. While Nebuchadnezzar has encircled the city of Jerusalem, he's preparing to tear down its walls. He's starving the people to death in the midst of the city. It'd be really easy for the nations that are surrounding Jerusalem to boast over the destruction that is raining down upon God's people, to mock the Jews, to mock their gods, and boast that they have superiority over the Jewish people and their God. So God sent out a series of prophecies, which is Ezekiel 25 through 32, uh, during the course of that siege to let these nations know that the judgment that you think that you're safe from, the judgment that you're belittling the Jewish people on for enduring, that same judgment is coming for you next. And I'm going to go over most of this rather briefly for two reasons. One, I don't think anybody wants a long, multiple-week series on the judgment of the nation surrounding Jerusalem. And also, we'll probably want to spend most of our time talking about Ezekiel, 20, uh, Ezekiel 28. And if you don't remember what's in Ezekiel 28, uh, you'll probably quickly remember what this chapter is about once we get there. So the first chapter, uh, Ezekiel 25, is four short denunciations on the four nations that are the closest to Jerusalem, and then he will spend most of his time on Tyre and Egypt, and I'll explain why in a moment. So Ezekiel 25 is a four-part judgment. Ammon is judged in 25, 1 through 7. Moab is judged in 25, 8 through 11. Edom is judged in 25, 12 through 14. And the city-states of Philistia, Philistia didn't have a single king or ruler, so it's more of a collection of cities uh, that were seen as one group of people. But Philistia is judged in 25, 15 through 17. So Ezekiel chapter 25 is a judgment upon Ammon, Moab, Edom, and Philistia. These are the nations that are to the south, the east, and the west of Judah. So Ezekiel hits the four nations that are the closest to the city of Jerusalem. And looking at this map, you can see that Ezekiel is hitting all of those nations that are going to have an upfront, up-close view to the siege of Jerusalem. The reason that he's not hitting the nation of the north, because that is Israel. And at this point, Israel has still not recovered from their destruction at the hands of Assyria. So in modern day terms, we would say that Israel at this time period is a failed state. It's a land area that really has no functioning government ruling over top of it. And following this judgment upon the four nations that are surrounding Judah, he then spends three chapters on Tyre and Sidon, which I'm going to call just Tyre for the rest of our time this morning. And so there are a lot of questions. Why would God dedicate so much time on this very small trade nation of Tyre? Tyre never really stands out as an enemy of the Jewish people. Actually, for most of the history of Judah, Tyre and the Jews were allies. I just was reading in my own Bible reading this morning about the building of Solomon's temple. And if you remember in the story of Solomon's temple, one of the probably the longest section in that, um, the building of Solomon's temple is talking about how Solomon got all of his wood for the temple and he got it through a large trade partnership with Hiram, the king of Tyre. So why spend all of this time on the denunciation of Tyre? Uh, there's a few reasons that are suggested. First is that Tyre was actually the one nation that was most difficult for Nebuchadnezzar never to overthrow. And it was so difficult that Nebuchadnezzar was actually never able to conquer the capital city of Tyre. So for the most part, they escaped judgment at the hands of the Babylonians. The reason being is that Tyre dominated the waters as 
a trading nation. And at this point, you could say because of all of their merchant vessels, Tyre probably had the only functioning navy in the entire world. And it's sort of hard to defeat an enemy who has total control of the waters when their capital city is right on the coastline. Uh, but the uh, Tyre won't escape judgment as Alexander the Great will come in and wipe out their, ans- their empire. The second reason that the focus is seen on Tyre, the second suggestion is that while Tyre in itself is a very small nation, just basically taking up a couple of cities, at the same time, uh, Tyre had established colonies that stretched throughout the entire known world. So Tyre had colony cities in Cyprus, Rhodes, Malta, Spain, Sicily, Sardinia, the Balric Islands, and throughout Africa to support her trading practices. Therefore, a judgment upon Tyre will showcase God's power and foreknowledge over the entire world, leading to a dedicated part of judgment upon Tyre. Uh, The third reason that you'd have a long section of judgment on Tyre is because of the attitude at that time period of the king of Tyre. At this point in history, there were really three men in the world who viewed themselves not as mortal men, but saw themselves as divine. They were gods living on earth. Nebuchadnezzar saw himself as divine, and we dealt with some of that uh, in the book of Daniel. Uh, Also, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, would have seen himself as one of the gods. And also, we know the king of Tyre. Uh, saw himself as a divine being as well. And so for all of those reasons, we're going to, uh, Ezekiel will spend three chapters talking about the downfall of the nation of Tyre, uh, something that will cause the entire world to tremble. So let's look at the end of 26 with the judgment that will come upon Tyre. Thus says the Lord God to Tyre, Will the coastlands not shake at the sound of your fall? When the wounded cry, when slaughter is made in the midst of you, then all the princes of the sea will come down from their thrones. Lay aside their robes and take off their embroidered garments. They will close themselves with trembling. They will sit on the ground, tremble every moment, and be astonished at you. And they will take up a lamentation and say to you, How have you perished? O one inhabited by seafaring men, O renowned city, who who was strong at sea, she and her inhabitants, who caused their terror to be on all her inhabitants. Now the coastlands tremble on the day of your fall. Yes, the coastlands by the sea are troubled at your departure. So one of the emphasis of this section is that the downfall of Tyre will not just be something that will affect Tyre, but the entire world will feel the ramifications by it, as it's not just Tyre who becomes wealthy based upon their trade practices, but Tyre brings wealth and prosperity to pretty much everyone on the earth due to their merchant activities. Chapter 27 is written as a lament over the ruin of Tyre. Uh, Chapter 27 is a song. It is technically a dirge, a funeral dirge over the nation. It begins with uh, actually, uh, (coughs) oh, excuse me. I guess I'm allergic to Tyre. Uh, It begins with a boasting over Tyre and her wonderful ships. The nation of Tyre, their their ships, their merchant trading vessels were basically a wonder of the world at this time period. No one had sailing vessels like the people of Tyre did. They entirely dominated the water. It also speaks to something in chapter 27 that I didn't really key on in before I was studying uh, this past week, and that is also the troops that Tyre has is pointed out in this chapter. As chapter 2710, speaking of the mercenary troops, troops that Tyre hired, it says that they were from Persia, Lydia, and Libya were in your army as men of war. They hung shield and helmet in you, and they gave you splendor. And this is really an astounding statement to make about the troops of Tyre, to say that they come from Persia, Lydia, and Libya. Persia is located in what is today modern-day Iran, north of the Babylonian Empire, Lydia was a city that was located in modern-day Greece. 
So he had, they had Iranian troops, they had Greek troops, and then Libya is located to the west of Egypt and Africa. So uh, Tyre was able to amass a troops which came from Iran, they came from Greece, they came from Africa, basically to say that uh, Tyre was able to pull in a mercenary force over the entire known world. Uh, verses 17 through 25 lists all the wonderful goods that she's traded. Uh, it really is an impressive amount of goods that were traded by the nation of Tyre. So the song begins this funeral dirge uh, like we do a normally in a funeral. One of the things that you would do in a funeral to somebody who had just passed away is you talk about, oh man, he's just the greatest person. He, he was so kind and wonderful of a man. He'd, he'd give anybody his shirt off of his back. He was just such a great person. You know, you spend a lot of time in a funeral talking about how wonderful they are. And that's how Ezekiel begins the funeral dirge for Tyre, talking about how great and magnificent the nation is. And then in verses 26 through 36, mourns over her future downfall. So a song that is all the more poignant after listing her great wealth and her great influence upon the world. So what we have in chapter 6 is a prophecy talking about how Tyre will be laid waste. Chapter 27 is a funeral song given on behalf of the nation of Tyre. And then we make it to the main event of the judgment upon Tyre, and that is chapter 28, a judgment that is directed uh, specifically at the king of Tyre. And the debate in Ezekiel chapter 28 is, who is Ezekiel talking about when he is prophesying on the king of Tyre? Is he talking about the king of Tyre? Is he talking about the king of Tyre's son? Because he talks about the prince of Tyre as well. Uh, is Ezekiel talking about Satan? Uh, because we also have that prophecy in Isaiah chapter 14, where it looks like Isaiah could either be talking about the uh, king of Babylon or of Satan. I take it really specifically to refer to the king of Babylon in Isaiah. I think it's a future prophecy of Nebuchadnezzar and his father. Uh, so in Ezekiel 28, is he talking about the king of Tyre or is he talking about Satan? Well, first, let's uh, identify who was the man of this time period that Ezekiel would be talking about, and that is a man by the name of Ethbal. Uh, he was the king of Tyre during the siege of Jerusalem, so from the years 588 to 586 when Jerusalem was under siege. The king of Tyre was Ethbal, and so he would have been the one that this prophecy was directed at. And we do want to also want to make a note that while it talks about the king of Tyre and the prince of Tyre, we should not see this as Ethbal and his son, but king and prince were interchangeable terms during this period of time. Uh, there's actually numerous prophecies in the book of in the book of Ezekiel, where Ezekiel refers to Zedekiah as the prince of Judah. So when we read of the prince of Tyre, the king of Tyre, this is not a father-son duo, but these are both talking about the same person, and that is Ethbal. So based upon the larger context of Ezekiel 25 through 32 uh, that Ezekiel 28 comes upon, and then also based upon the specific wording of Ezekiel 28, 1 and also 28, 12, we need to say that Ezekiel chapter 28 is primarily talking about the pride and the downfall of Ethbal, the king of Tyre. And he specifically calls him out in these uh, four verses of the chapter. The word of the Lord came to me again, saying, Son of man, say to the prince of Tyre, Thus says the Lord God, Because your heart is lifted up and you say, I am a God. I sit in the seats of the gods in the midst of the seas, yet you are a man and not a God, though you set your heart as the heart of a God. And then repeated in verses 11 and 12, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre, and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom, and perfect in beauty. So we need to see the king of Tyre and the prince of Tyre as the same person because they are parallel terms during this time period. They mean the same thing. And we should say that Ezekiel 28 as a whole 
primarily, first and foremost, is referring to Ethbal. And we have this lofty, angelic language that is in here that I know makes me want to say, look at what this is talking about. It's clearly talking about Satan. And I think we need to draw back and say, not so fast. We shouldn't be surprised that Ezekiel uses this sort of godlike, angelic language to refer to Ethbal, because how does he say in verse 2, Ethbal saw himself? Ethbal saw himself as a god. Ethbal believed that he was so mighty, he sat upon the clouds. So we know first and foremost that this chapter is speaking about Ethbal, but the second question is, can this be talking about two people at one time? Is this talking about both Ethbal and also referring to Satan? So we could say maybe it's, it's initially talking about Ethbal and his time period, but it is, is it also talking about the force, the one who is working behind Ethbal? So is this referring to two people at once? And I'm going to read verses 12 through 15 as a whole. And as soon as we read this, we're going to say, man, how could this not be talking about Satan at all? So Ezekiel 28, 12 through 15 says, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre and say to him, thus says the Lord God, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God, precious stone was your covering. The sardis, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. So I don't know about you, but I read those verses and I'm like, man, this is definitely talking about the fall of Satan. I mean, this cherub who is before God, uh, who was created blameless and then fell, uh, how could this not be talking about Satan? And then I spent a whole bunch of time studying these verses this week after expecting to come in here and being like, this is totally, definitely about Satan. And now my view is, maybe it's about Satan? It. it it, it, could, it could be a little bit. I, I'm not really sure. And why I say that is, uh, first, if you look at how this chapter was interpreted um, by the Jewish people, so how the Jews would have seen Ezekiel 28, uh, we don't have any evidence that throughout all of human history, uh, the Jewish people ever, <laughs> all of human history, yeah, I'm really going way out on a limb there, uh, since it's writing until today, uh, we don't have any evidence that the Jewish people ever saw this as referring to to Satan. So we don't have any references in the Talmuds or any biblical or any Jewish writings of any Jews ever taking this to be Satan. Uh, Robert Alter, who is a Jewish scholar who wrote an Old Testament commentary on the Old Testament, uh, he believes that there isn't enough information in this chapter to connect it to any other figure in the Hebrew Bible. So the Jewish view is that it doesn't refer to Satan at all. Uh, the first person to actually tie Ezekiel 28 to Satan, we, we know who this is. And this is, I always think, exciting when we know the first person who brought out a specific theory. And that was Jerome. Jerome, who brought us the Latin Vulgate, was the first one to suggest that, hey, I think this refers to Satan. And when I saw that it was Jerome, my initial thought was like, oh, man, dependent upon Jerome. And the reason I say that is because if we were to look at uh, all of the other allegories that Jerome brings up throughout his teachings, for the most part, we'd look at them and be like, uh, I don't think I'm going to go with Jerome on that one. And so this would be one of the few places where if you see this as Satan, you will go to it as Jerome. Uh, and then another fascinating thing that I learned this week is that there's actually a large number of Christian scholars throughout history who, on the one hand, yes, saw this as Satan like Jerome, but who also saw this as a reference to, and I didn't see this one coming, to Adam 
in the Garden of Eden with the idea that Adam was the first one that God created. God made um, Adam to be blameless. He was the highest of all people before he fell. And so Ezekiel is basically mocking the king of Tyre, saying, you think that you're so proud, you think that you're such a great person, you're seeing yourself the same as Adam, but what happened to Adam in the garden? Adam fell. So in the same way Adam fell in the garden, you will fall in the garden as well, king of Tyre. So the traditional Christian interpretations of this, cha- of this chapter are to see it as either Satan or as Adam. And then there are some who say we shouldn't take this back to Genesis at all. But we should simply see this as a mockery of Ethbal, the king of Tyre, and those who want to hold it to king of Tyre without having a second view to saying this also teaches us about Satan or also takes us back to Adam. The ones who want to root it here in this time period alone is based upon the verse that follows verse 15, and that is verse 16. As verse 16 actually describes what the iniquity was that this cherub fell to at the end of verse 15. And the iniquity was, by the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within and you sinned. And so to describe what that iniquity is in the following verses as trading that is filled with violence... Uh, That does not sound like the downfall of Satan. He would not have fallen with trading mixed with violence. Doesn't sound like the downfall of Adam. Uh, Him and Eve weren't involved with a marketplace relationship that had violence in it. But it would fit very well with the king of Tyre. Uh, So those who want to stick with Tyre alone, uh, they will make it uh, in verse 16. I also... um, went back to my old seminary notes uh, and found that my seminary professor, uh, Dr. Homer Heater, wrote a little bit on this chapter, and he believes that it is only talking about Ethbal and no one else. And one of his points was that we have the reference to the, uh, the mountain of God in verse 14, and he points out that when that phrase mountain of God is used, In this context, we think mountain of God. This is Satan up in heaven at the mountain of God. But actually, the phrase mountain of God, uh, when you look at how it's used in the Hebrew Bible, it points to the city of Jerusalem and not to heaven. And so what uh, Dr. Heater said is that the king of Tyre was seen in walking in pride over the people of Jerusalem. And also those lists of stones that are listed in that chapter, those are the same stones that are to be on the high priest's breastplate. And so this is Ezekiel talking about how uh, Ethbal may have become so boastful in his pride that he saw the glory of the breastplate of the high priest and decided to copy that for himself in order to boast of his own magnificence. Now, my favorite commentator on the book of Ezekiel, the guy who I think wrote the best book on uh, this book of the Bible, is a commentator by the name of Charles Feinberg. Uh, Feinberg believes that we need to look to Ethbal primarily, but he sees this as also looking to Satan as an illustration of the pride and the downfall of Ethbal. So, so, so Ezekiel has this little break of a couple of verses talking about Satan to illustrate the pride and the downfall of Ethbal. But what I thought was interesting in Feinberg's commentary was that he was really insistent to say that uh, if you look at Ezekiel 28, and you only talk about Satan, if you come there just to talk about the downfall of Satan, you are abusing Ezekiel chapter 28. Because this chapter is not written to teach us about Satan. This chapter is written to teach us about Ethbal. So if you're going to, uh, even if you see it as a reference to Satan, you need to make sure that you're tying it back to Ethbal at the same time and seeing both of them together because Ethbal is the primary uh, reference to this chapter. So after all of the time that I spent reading on these terms and how they're used in the Hebrew Bible and uh, sort of the historical interpretation of this section throughout Jewish and church history, uh, 
my opinion is that it is primarily pointing to Ethbal and that there is a possibility that Satan is used as an illustration of the pride and downfall of Ethbal, but we can't be dogmatic that that is what is happening. And I would also say that we should not uh, take information we find in Ezekiel 28 and use that to inform us about Satan. We shouldn't base our angelology, our demonology, our teaching on Satan based upon what we find in Ezekiel 28, uh, but that we should only use that if we can use it to confirm what we find in other passages of Scripture and not to develop teaching on Satan because I don't think that it is, uh, speci- if there is enough information in here to warrant that it is definitely talking about Satan because I think the other two possibilities that it is pointing to Adam or that it is specifically only pointing to Beth Ethbal, I think those both have too much merit to say that we can definitively know that it is talking about Satan. So at uh, that point, we should not use this chapter to establish our understanding on Satan. And I would say the biggest reason why, though, is that Ezekiel himself says, I'm talking about the king of Tyre. I'm talking about a man who thinks he's a god. Uh, so I think there, I, I say I think there's an allusion to Satan there, but I wouldn't be dogmatic and specific about that. Okay, so that is the downfall of Tyre in three sections. You got a dist- picture of the destruction of the country. You got a lament over Tyre, and then you have uh, a judgment upon the king of Tyre itself. And now the longest section of judgment that is chapters 29 through 32, and that is a judgment upon Egypt. And really kind of specifically not on Egypt, but on Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, who is called a crocodile. And the reason being that this is placed, this judgment is placed upon Egypt is that at this point in time, the Jewish people in Jerusalem, they were placing their hopes on Egypt to come and deliver them. And if also, if you remember, after the city of Jerusalem falls, where do the Jews go in order to seek refuge during that time? They take Jeremiah and they go off to Egypt. So God leads his, leaves his uh, biggest judgment upon an alliance with the Egyptians. And these prophecies also take place over a large period of long, a lengthy period of time. There's a few different dates in there. Most of them take place during the siege on Jerusalem, but specifically one of these prophecies is actually the last one that Ezekiel gave in his life. And what I found most fascinating in this chapter is that twice Pharaoh is equated with some type of a river monster. Uh, We read about it in Ezekiel 29.3. Here's how the New American Standard Bible does it. Speak and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, the great monster that lies in the midst of the river that has said, My Nile is mine, and I myself have made it. And I'm not sure why some translations call this monster a dragon. Uh, It's not only in the King James Version they call it a dragon, but there's also, like I think the English Standard Version, a couple other modern versions call this a dragon. So I had to do a bunch of you know, research. Why you call this a dragon? Like, is this, are they actually talking about him being some mythical creature? Uh, but the Hebrew word that's used here is a word that's uh, the Hebrew word uh, tanin. And tanin is used for some type of a creature that is most often related to water in some way. It looks like it's a creature that lives most of the time in the water, but is sometimes also on land. And the most interesting thing I found looking at this word tanan is that when Moses is in the wilderness and Moses is like, God, I can't go and stand before Pharaoh. Uh, one of the first things God tells Moses to do is, well, I'm to give you courage to go stand before Pharaoh. I want you to throw your staff on the ground. So Moses throws the staff on the ground, and it turns into a serpent. So then Moses goes to Egypt, stands before Pharaoh to do his first miracle, throws his staff on the ground, and it turns into a tanin. And it's not, it's not a serpent. And it says Pharaoh also makes tunnins, and Moses' tunnins eats Pharaoh's tunnins. And so there's that one instance of it. And there's also an instance in Deuteronomy 32 where a tunnin is said to be poisonous. But then going through all the other references to tunnin in the Old Testament, 
Like, I think it's, I don't even know why this is a debate. It totally sounds like a crocodile. Like, it's totally what makes sense in all of the other references, is that it, that word is the Hebrew word for a crocodile, which to me puts a whole nother spin on that story with Moses before Pharaoh, is that did Moses throw down his staff before Pharaoh and crocodile? And then two little crocodiles come out from Pharaoh's magicians and Moses' crocodile eats their crocodiles. That's it's the term that's used. I, I, thought, I, just, I thought it was really cool. So, uh, but Pharaoh is called the Tanin. Uh, like I said, in the vast majority of uses of it, it really just sounds like a crocodile. It's an animal that lives in the Nile River, also will come out onto the land and is a beast, and is kind of a monster in its descriptions. It's almost impossible to catch and train. I mean, crocodile just makes sense when you put all those together. Uh, So Pharaoh is a crocodile, um, and so the point of these chapters, though, is to predict the doom of Egypt, with it, which is a crocodile. There is sort of a poetry structure to all four of these chapters, which is chapter 29 is doom and destruction on Egypt. Chapter 30 is lament and crying over that destruction. Chapter 31, we go back to the doom and the destruction again. And then chapter 32 is another lament upon Egypt. So it's a, it's a structure of, uh, it's, a, it's really a huge, huge Hebrew poem of doom, lament, doom, lament over top of Egypt. So there is the judgment upon the neighbors. Uh, next week, we're going to slow way down after going through so many this week. Uh, we're only going to look at one chapter next week. That's Ezekiel 33. And the reason we want to take one week for that chapter is that we're talking about Uh, two of the more important notes of the book of Ezekiel, and that is Ezekiel's role as the watchman, which is a rather significant passage for the book, and then also that's the chapter where they have the news, Jerusalem has fallen. So it's a rather significant chapter, so we'll spend a week on that next week.